Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are recording some lectures on the renal system today. This is part one. First, a few words of introduction. Most of our patients who receive uh, diuretics in the operating room or who are taking them in their perioperative period are usually taking them to avoid fluid overload. And fluid overload just means that a patient's salt and water intake exceeds their losses and their excretion of salt and water. Remember that water usually follows salt, so questions of fluid overload are often closely related to questions of salt balance. Patients can be fluid overloaded throughout their whole body, or they can be fluid overloaded in just one compartment. For example, they can have pulmonary edema and their lungs can be fluid overloaded. Edema is a word that just means passage of fluid from the vasculature into some other interstitial space. And other examples of fluid overload might be congestive heart failure, renal failure, or cirrhosis. Now this can be treated or prevented by fluid restriction, although that isn't always very comfortable for patients, and it can uh, be a challenge. Other times we actually need to diurese patients in order to remove excess fluid. In the kidney, the blood flows into the kidney from a renal artery and it flows into a small structure called a glomerulus. So an, ar an artery branches into arterioles and each arteriole feeds a glomerulus. I'm just going to jump ahead to show the picture here. Here you can see the um, arteriole coming in and this structure here is the glomerulus where this arteriole branches into a lot of little capillaries which are bathed in the very proximal part of the renal tubule. And at this point, there's filtration. All sorts of small molecules and salts and other solutes are filtered out of the vasculature and into the proximal renal tubule. Jumping back for just a moment here. The other thing that can happen is reabsorption. So water and solute, especially sodium, can be reabsorbed out of this renal tubule back into the vasculature at various points throughout this renal tubule. Jumping back for just a moment, sodium usually moves isotonically, which means that sodium moves and water follows the sodium to maintain constant osmotic pressures. If we look at a patient's fena, which is their fractional excretion of sodium, that is to say of all the sodium that enters the renal tubule over here, what fraction of it actually goes out in the urine at the other end? Patient's fena is usually less than 1%, which means 99 plus percent of the salt that enters the renal tubule on this side never makes it out. It gets reabsorbed back into the body. Sodium is absorbed throughout the renal tubule, and your diuretics work at all of these different places. Because if we can block sodium reabsorption, and patients excrete more than 1% of their sodium, water is going to be excreted along with that sodium. And if a patient has renal failure, so there's no longer any absorption, there's no longer any filtration of solute into the kidney, then the diuretics can't get into the kidney, and the diuretics can't work. And so as we talk about different renal drugs, we'll see that they work at different points in this renal tubule. This is just another picture of the kidney. Here's a cross-section of the kidney with a renal artery coming in, branching into arterioles and eventually into this tiny little network. Each of these sections of the kidney is called a calyx, and if I take a piece out and look at it in wedge section, here you can see the arterial blood coming in, making a little glomerulus. The glomerulus goes into this uh, renal tubule, this nephron, which has a loop in it. When we talk about loop diuretics, that's the loop. And at the end of the nephron, we have a collecting duct, which eventually branches together and leads into this calyx, which will, um, which is where the urine will collect and the urine will go out. Meanwhile, at the other end of the glomerulus, blood leaves the glomerulus and is drained into the venous system, and the venous system all collects back into the renal veins, which goes back to the circulation. Now the first uh, diuretic that we're going to talk about is a little bit of an oddball, something that you may not see very much in your clinical practice. 
But it is something that shows up in some textbooks, and I thought we would cover it briefly. To understand, first we need to talk about the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, which is involved in the management of carbonic acid. Now normally, your kidney is capable of pumping <coughs> hydrogen ions into the urine using the sodium hydrogen pump. Sodium leaves the urine and hydrogen can be pumped in. This is important because bicarbonate is filtered into your urine, and if you lose all of that bicarbonate, you can become acidotic. So your body has a way of retrieving that, carb that bicarbonate, and the way it does that is it mixes the bicarbonate with hydrogen ion that can be pumped into the urine. This creates carbonic acid, and then the enzyme carbonic anhydrase converts carbonic acid into water and CO2, which can be absorbed back into the body. And this occurs in the proximal tubule of the kidneys. Now, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, most commonly we talk about acetazolamide, which is known as diamox, and when we inhibit carbonic anhydrase, when we inhibit this reaction that we just talked about, so then we have a little bit of a buildup of the hydrogen ion that's been pumped into the urine, and actually this reverses the sodium hydrogen pump. We have so much hydrogen buildup that hydrogen leaves the urine and sodium comes into the urine. And as we know, when sodium is in the urine, water follows it, and this makes a diuretic effect. The side effect, as you can imagine, would be that we've lost hydrogen, but we still have this bicarbonate, and the bicarbonate is excreted in the urine, so we have excess bicarbonate in the urine, which makes it alkaline. And patients develop a metabolic acidosis, actually a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So when are patients actually given acetazolamide? Well, patients who have moderate to severe respiratory alkalosis, or metabolic alkalosis, rather, can be treated with this drug. It can be used as diuresis for heart failure. It's actually used as a treatment for altitude sickness, which is something we'll discuss in class a little bit. And it turns out that acetazolamide also helps decrease production of certain fluids in the eye, like aqueous humor as well as cerebrospinal fluid. So it may be used in the treatment of glaucoma, pseudotumor cerebri, and also may have some role in the treatment of epilepsy or central sleep apnea. That's about all I really want to say about acetazolamide. I wouldn't test you very much on this except to understand the basics of carbonic anhydrase and to understand that as a result it makes the urine alkaline. Take a moment to consider if you have any questions that you would like to email me or discuss in class, and then we'll move on. The next diuretic I want to speak about is mannitol. Mannitol is an example of an osmotic diuretic. Mannitol is filtered freely into the kidney and is very hard to reabsorb. As a result, water cannot be absorbed out of the kidney back into the circulation because of the large amount of osmotic particles of mannitol that exist inside the kidney. So normally water would follow sodium, but now we have an osmotic force tugging the water back into the kidney and limiting reabsorption. And this is done by increasing the renal tubular osmolarity. Mannitol does another thing. It doesn't only work in the kidneys, but actually it works in the entire body. When you put mannitol into the circulation, we increase the osmotic pressure, the osmotic particles in the vasculature. And this draws water out of cells into the vasculature, into the plasma. And then due to this increased intravascular volume, renal blood flow increases as well. So you can see several mechanisms by which mannitol can act as a diuretic. Now when we pull all this fluid out of the cells into the circulation, patients can actually become a little bit fluid overloaded, which is fine for me and you, but maybe not for someone who has a bad heart. Then it could put them into pulmonary edema or congestive heart failure. And actually because all that free water is coming into their circulation, they can become transiently hyponatremic. They can dilute out the sodium in their circulation. Now of course once they've diuresed out all of this free water, patients can become a little hypernatremic. They can get concentrated sodium in their, blood, in their bloodstream. A lot of people have thought that mannitol had some magic 
uh, protective powers for the kidney, that somehow it protected the kidney. And we do see that patients who get renal transplant get mannitol and seem to have better outcomes. But that's about it. In patients who are having uh, AAA repairs or ruptured AAAs and they're clamping above the renal arteries, there's no evidence that giving mannitol to these patients reduces kidney injury, reduces reperfusion injury, or anything like that. When else do we use mannitol? Well, we use it in the neuro room, in neuroanesthesia, because like we said, mannitol draws water out of cells into the plasma, so it does that very well in the brain, and we can decompress the brain and decrease ICP, or intraocular pressure, by giving mannitol to uh, diurese the brain. You should be careful when you give mannitol. If it extravasates, if it goes into a blown IV, it can cause a lot of tissue injury, a lot of swelling, a lot of compartment syndrome as it draws water into that extravasated tissue. So you have to be really careful and always try to give mannitol through a line that you're able to visually inspect. In the neuro room, the dose of mannitol is usually somewhere between 0.25 and 1 grams of mannitol per kilogram of body weight. We'll stop the recording here. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll pick up with the next recording.